Open your Bibles with me for what time we have this morning into the book of Philippians. It's in the New Testament, halfway through it. Um, so yeah, hearing of Joy's and Alex's struggle, I mean, so you look out here and you're sitting beside people who also have lots of different struggles. And not all struggles are the same. And, you know, two people could face the same struggle and face it completely different because not all people are the same. Not all struggles are created equally though either, right? I mean, some people, for example, I, I just wanted you to see this, this, some people's struggles that are uh, hopefully going to be able to play on this video for us. Just a little reminder that not all struggles are created equally. And if we can't get to it, Gail, that's all right. Good? There we go. A little poor quality video. Our struggle this morning might be to watch the video. <laughs> I think we'll just cancel it there. Otherwise, it's going to be our struggle <laughs> just to survive the morning. It happens. There's the best of technology we have to offer right there, apparently. So, yeah, that video, if you would have watched it, it was a short video, but it was some catastrophes with the wind just blowing their umbrellas to shreds. Um, but it, and it was really just a kind of a fun way to introduce this idea of struggle, the reality that we we all face struggles. I mean, we heard from Joy and Alex just a moment ago, and, you know, we prayed for Karen, and, and we've been praying for Emily and, and for Laura and for others as well. And, you know, what, but I wondered, is that really the greater or the greatest struggles that we might have to face in life? What are, what are the greater struggles that we all are forced to Throughout life, there's going to be many, really, umbrella moments. But really, I think there's on a, on a far bigger scale, um, there's something that humanity struggles with that we are, I think it's revealed at Christmas time, actually. Um, it could be, you know, we could think about COVID, right? Or we could think about the latest you know, variant of COVID and think, man, that's got to be humanity's greatest struggle. You know, this COVID that we're facing right now. Or maybe I, I received an email this week from somebody who's, who's greatly concerned about the, the sexualization of our children. And this is an email I got, you know, we're, our, we're, our children are being sexualized at an alarming rate. And they said it this way, the greatest humanitarian crisis in all of history. You know, so they're looking at that thing that's going on and they're saying, that's the greatest struggle of humanity. I'd like to offer that, um, like, I think we should consider that humanity's greatest struggle is, is not the latest variant of COVID. I, I want us to consider this morning that humanity's greatest struggle, as much of a struggle as cancer is, that there is a cancer that's infected actually humanity. I don't think that it's the exploitation and sexualization of our children, which is inexcusable for sure. And our greatest struggle is, is really, it's not. And, and this one, you know, we would agree with this one, but we all act differently. Our greatest struggle is not the political arena, arena that we live in. You know, that, that's not humanity's greatest struggle. I think humanity's greatest struggle is far deeper and way more insidious than, than all of that, which I've just mentioned, combined. I think humanity's greatest struggle is this. I think humanity's greatest struggle, not maybe the only, but one of, is actually selfishness and self-infatuation. 
It sounds harsh. I, I get as I was as I thought about that, even as I wrote it down and I see it, I'm like, man, just hearing that comes out of my mouth, it actually stings a little bit. Um, can we just like maybe acknowledge that that we kind of bristle at that idea? Can we just acknowledge that we're immediately wanting to push back against that and some sort of have some sort of rebuttal about that? Because it doesn't taste good in our mouths and it doesn't feel good in our guts. But I do believe that this is what the Bible actually reveals to us. Because it reveals that selfishness and, and self-infatuation will keep more people out of the kingdom of heaven than any other ailment or disease or cause, for that matter. When we pray, think about this for a moment. When we often pray for the children to go downstairs every week, we listen and remember this, that seven out of ten kids, seven out of ten of our kids are going to walk away from Christ and the church by the time they reach 18 years old. Five of them, statistically, might return when they have children. Because children will make you do desperate things, right? Um, but yeah. But two never will. That's a sobering thought. I mean, it, to think that that could happen. And so here's, as I've been trying to do this over the course of these last few weeks when we've been working through Philippians and in our Advent series, I've been trying to give you my point right near the front. And so I want to do that. I want to put the thesis right up there, that all those in Christ are called to and enabled to and will grow in desire to live selflessly as Jesus did, that there is hope in Christ. That's my point this morning, that we're here, we're not here to look at this and say, oh man, we are done for, there is no hope, we're hopeless. No, I want us to see by the time we're done this morning, that there is a far richer, fuller life for those who are uh, in Christ, for those who turn to Christ in faith, that there is a far higher calling and existence for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. The problem that we're facing is that our selfishness and self-interest is, is really ingrained in who we are. It's not something that we, we wake up each day and decide to be selfish. It just doesn't work that way. It's actually been hardwired into our DNA by our ancestors. We can look all the way back to Adam and Eve and say, hey, thanks a lot for that one. You know, I really appreciate that. You know, that's really helpful. Um, but uh, that's the reality. We are hardwired this way. That this, they won't share, is the, the cry of most every sibling group, right? When you grew up with brothers and sisters, and you didn't like to share your stuff with them, and, and you got ticked off when they didn't share their stuff with you. The psychologists, actually, the psychologist world have been telling us this for centuries. They have a fancier word for it. As I, was, I found this is really interesting. Psychologists call it the theory of egotism. The theory of egotism. Listen to what they say and how they define it. This is a psychological egoism suggests that all behaviors are motivated by self-interest. In other words, it suggests that every action, every action, behavior, or decision of every person. Now, this is the, the secular psychological world who are saying that every action from every person is motivated by self-interest. And they also suggest that every action is motivated by that and that the doctrine, and, they, and it's fine it's interesting that they use that word. The doctrine of self-motivation is simply a natural law, which means that it's really just accepted as reality amongst the whole profession. And it goes on to say, because psychological egoism states that every act of every person is motivated by self-interest, it's universal. Because psychological egoism states that all motivations 
in the final analysis, are selfish. It's, it's reductive in the sense that it reduces what seems to be a plurality or lots of reasons why or we are motivated, but they all come from a single cause. In consequence, all motives are selfish motives. Even if people sometimes act for others, it's only because they think that it's in their own best interest to do so. What a pronouncement on humanity. And that didn't even come from the Bible, right? I mean, that came from the, the, the doctors, the psychologists of the world. They're, that's their final analysis. They're saying we're hopeless. We're hopelessly selfish. We're hopelessly self-motivated. We're hopelessly only interested in pursuing something that benefits us. So when we to make us, help us make the point. When we go down to the Christmas tree on Christmas morning, what do we do? We look for the packages that have our names on them. Right? That's what we do. We, it's like natural. <laughs> Even secular psychologists admit that we're powerless in a sense against this. That all humanity is suffering from that struggle. That's bad news. Isn't it? I mean, I think that's really bad news, that there is no person who escapes that reality. But there is really good news. Really good news. The good news is that God, in sending his son, Jesus Christ, we are, among many other things, um, provided through the coming of Christ. We're provided an escape hatch. From selfishness, we are, we're really allowed in to see a far superior, richer, more fulfilling, joy-filled life. I'm going to see that in today's passages, I think, uh, that the advent or the, the coming of Christ into the world is the greatest display of selflessness that humanity has ever considered. And that those who follow Christ, who those who follow him, are, are really to walk as he walks. And there's an image of just that, what that looks like. It's a simple image of a little boy following in his dad's footsteps that, you know, to walk as Jesus walked. That, that through being reborn, we're now able, really, as those who are empowered by his Holy Spirit, we are set free from that empty, exclusive pursuit of self. And that's because that's exactly what it is. It's an empty pursuit. And when, when that pursuit of self is our exclusive pursuit, and, but there's a spoiler alert here we have to draw our, time, our mind to. And the spoiler alert is this, until I'm reborn, you know, the Bible, you know, that old-fashioned language, until I'm born again, you know, we hear that language in the Bible. And, and we, till I receive Jesus Christ and empowered by his Holy Spirit, when I do that through repenting and turning to Christ, if I don't do that, I'm going to be completely unable to be purely selfless in a God-honoring way, in a Christ-exalting way. So with that in mind, let's turn to our passage in Philippians chapter 2. As we're going to see in Christ coming the, the final and perfect picture of selflessness. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, if there are any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection at all, any sympathy, if there's any of this, if the coming of Christ and his subsequent death on our behalf has accomplished any of this at all in us, and complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. You know, so he's saying, is if you are in Christ, you are now new, you are you now released from the old and given the new. And he says in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus, who, 
talking about Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be even thought of or grasped. He couldn't grasp it. This is Christ, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And because of that, God has highly exalted Christ and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's what, that, that, that progression of that verse is designed to get you to the end of that, and you're supposed to be like compulsed to say amen. So let's hear it. Amen. amen. Right? With what time we have with ourselves this morning, I just want to be keying in really on just one verse. I want to go back to the middle of this because it, the front verses 1 through 4 point to verse 5 and then verse 6 through 11 actually are explaining verse 5. And so, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. I want to just key in on this. This mind, he says, have this mind. What is the this mind, the, the, the posture Really, he's talking about what's the, the view or really the approach, the mindset. Uh, mind, it's this. It's a mind emptied of the, that, what we already called and labeled the exclusive, empty pursuit of self. Instead, he says this. He offers this. Take on the form or the, the, really the, the posture, the, the mindset which is yours in Christ Jesus, the, the, this way of thinking, which is of being a servant. Um, see, we still look at this idea of servanthood as somehow it's a, a, it's a, it's a lesser life, uh, an undesirable calling uh, that we have to do as Christians, even though it isn't at all appealing um, but the way he presents it is something quite different. It wasn't as though Christ viewed this servanthood as some kind of lesser calling, but he viewed it as his greatest calling. He didn't look at it as though this was some kind of inferior life. Yeah, I got it. I guess I'll go down there and take on humanity. It really sucks that I'm the one who has to do this. I really hate that I have to do this, and I don't want to do this. You don't ever see that in Christ at all. He never looked at this as some kind of inferior calling, but he looks at it, and he's filled with joy to take on the role and to live that life. He was totally excited about what the Father had sent him to do. Not, not certainly the, all of the pain that would bring him, but this passage really just blows our understanding of humility out of the water. It just it has to. When it says he humbled himself, we have no idea, we couldn't possibly have any idea of the depth of humility that it would take to leave heaven's throne. We just couldn't have any concept of what it would look like for God to step into flesh, let alone as a baby. We, we, we might be able to image, imagine it if, if he came in some superhero hero costume and riding on this big white stallion or whatever the picture you might draw in your head of this conquering hero, but Jesus stepped into humanity as a human starting as a baby. We have no concept of that humility at all when it says he humbled himself. I just can't wrap my mind around that. And as though that wasn't enough to totally rock our image, Jesus, then it says he goes on to exhibit true obedience to God. You know, pure, sinless, holy perfect obedience to God, which is, again, it's a, it's a concept we just, we can't fathom. We, we have no concept of, of perfect 
willful, joyful obedience to God. He says he, that he did it even all the way to the point of death. Even that the death itself was an act of obedience. Even death on a cross. I and mean, when you read these verses in verses 6 through 11, the image is amazing. And it's kind of scary in a sense that, that Christ obeying the will of God led him to the cross. And, and down deep, again, if we're really honest with ourselves, we don't have a little bit of fear about that, don't we? That if we somehow totally and fully obey God, it might be harder than we want it to be to be Christians. Like we have that little scary thought in our brain. I just want to let that sit there for a second because we struggle with the idea of full obedience to God because we're afraid of what he might ask us to do sometime. But the images that we're given here is that full and complete joy is actually the result. It's the opposite of what we, it's totally upside down and inside out. It's counterintuitive to what we would expect it to look like. He doesn't sit there in this defeated place. It's the image that we're given here is he is full and complete joy is discovered in the humble, obedient servanthood. The emptying, um, of the emptiness of emptying the pursuit of our self-interest is where we're seeing. It's like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, we envision it to be something different than what it actually is, the, the secret to the happy life that we're looking for. It is just not the pursuit of every whim and ambition. It's in loving God and, and seeking to walk as Jesus walked. That's where the pot at the end of the rainbow lies. That's the secret. Paul actually says that I've learned the secret. See, the pastor of Philippi, of Paul, makes this astonishing pronouncement. He says, this mind, that understanding, if you are in Christ Jesus, this is what he says. He says, God super implanted that in you. This idea, this concept, this mindset, this posture, that full and complete joy lies at the emptying of self, not in the passionate pursuit of self. Think about that. This means that we already possess it. He's already put it in us. Part of the new life you receive in Christ is this new mind. It's what he's, he's showing us. He says that in verse 5. Put this mind in you that, you, that is yours in Christ Jesus. It also means that we have this new sense of calling. The richer, fuller experience is what we're called to as followers of Christ. It's, this is part of what it looks like to follow him. And it also means that Jesus has placed new desires in us. As followers of Christ, we, we increasingly, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We begin to desire what he desires and, and this humble, obedient servanthood is what he desires. Clearly, Christ's extreme humility, his unfathomable obedience and, and, and selflessness is what you know Paul is talking about when he looks at this passage when he says to us, have this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's kind of staggering as we really fully think it through. This is where we get into our own heads a little bit too much sometimes and we get into a mental, even existential argument with ourselves. It's been hardwired into our fallen sinful flesh to think that the path to true, true joy, to true joy and, and abundant living is through, we think it's through the pursuit of every passion that comes our, our way, you know, through the pursuit of self. But we're confronted here with the opposite assertion, really, that in fact, tr true joy, that in fact, abundant living, who, this is what we want out of life. We want joy and abundance. We want abundant living, but it says here that it's found in the opposite direction of our intuition, of our intuition. 
It's counterintuitive. It's not in the pursuing of self, but actually in the emptying of self. It's only when we understand these verses, these verses 5 through 11, in their proper context that we can ex really appreciate what Paul is calling us to in the first five verses. We go back and read that. So now, since that's true, since this is our mind now that we have, for those of us who are in Christ, he says if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, if there's any of this, it's like just almost hear his pleading voice, if the coming of Christ and his subsequent death on our behalf has accomplished anything in us, this is what it should have accomplished. And he goes on, this is what he says next though, this is what I thought was astonishing. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. This mind that is ours in Christ Jesus. If you want full joy, if you want complete joy, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Like, I'm not sure I would have gone there. I'm not sure I would have gone there in, that, in my headspace. I'm not sure I would have said, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. If I'm looking for complete joy, I'm, I'm trying to throw off all of those things. It seems so counterintuitive. Let each of you look not to your own interests, he says in verse 4, but also to the interests of others. Have that mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The apostle's saying that the mindset, that mindset, that posture is the path to complete joy. That's the path to fullness of life. That's the point of Christmas. Christ coming frees us from the empty, exclusive pursuit of the self. As though that's our only pursuit. It, empty, it frees us from that. Complete my joy, he says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one another. He's pointing us to deeperness. He's, he's pointing us to richness. He's pointing us to fullness. I love this quote from uh, one of the commentators. It says, The gospel of Jesus has impressed on Paul that counterintuitive truth that the pursuit of happiness when fueled by selfish ambition is bound to end in bitter disappointment. The gospel of Jesus, let me see that again, has impressed on Paul that the counterintuitive truth, that the pursuit of happiness, when it's fueled by selfish ambition, is bound to end in bitter disappointment. Whereas, he goes on to say, the highest, strongest joy surprises and overtakes those who find their hearts so drawn to others' well-being that their personal comfort and pleasure Pleasure slip from view. Hmm. That the strongest joy surprises and overtakes those who find their hearts so drawn to others that their personal comfort and pleasure slip from view. The joy of following Christ in humble, obedient servanthood I think is it could possibly have two really unexpected consequences as well. Positively, two unexpected blessings. And the first one is this. <clears throat> Even though it's so counterintuitive to what we believe, it might be the one thing that equips our children for a strong, vibrant, enduring faith after they leave the protection of our home. Remember that statistic that I shared. If in Christ we are giving a new mind that is counter, it, that is completely upside down of what the world of psychology and all of humanity already recognizes, that the, the pursuit of self-interest is humanity's condition. If we are giving a new mind in Christ and we can display that, if we start to pursue that 
that following Christ in humble, obedient servanthood brings full joy. And we start to model that in our homes so that our children, that's what they're witnessing, so that they see us in that way. That we start to pursue the interests of others. We don't deny the necessities of our own interests. We, we look to the interests of others and maybe that one of the responses that our children see will bring about a lasting, vibrant, joy-filled faith walk. That's just, hmm, maybe that's what's been missing. In our pursuits of self, even though we do it in the name of Christianity, that our children are looking at us and they're saying, that's no thanks, you know? Just a thought. Then maybe the other unexpected consequence, though, I think in today's culture, we were talking about this at our Wednesday night upward young adult small group. Boy, you want to look different in today's culture. Be selfless. I think that could be one of our loudest witnesses as Christians and as a church. Be selfless. Pursue the interests of others. Look to find ways to bless other people, even quietly and secretly. Lord, uh, we, we want that to be so in us. Let's pray towards that end. Would you bow with me and pray? Lord, we do pray that that would be that mind that is in those who are in Christ Jesus, that we would... really seek to walk as you walked and not find it as, um, as though somehow it's a, it's a lesser calling or somehow it's kind of a defeatist, not fun, I don't want to do this but I know I'm supposed to kind of mindset. And that we would put away this idea that if we follow Christ, it means the end of living fully. So I really think, God, I know I'm guilty of that. I think some are. We're guilty of thinking that somehow following Jesus means kissing the good life goodbye. When all we see throughout all of Scripture what we see in you, Jesus, isn't kissing life goodbye. We see joy, unbounded joy, unending peace. We see in Christ the unbelievable <coughs> beauty of being in communion with God, our Father. And it's not offered as a lesser life. It's seen as an offering to us the rich, full, abundant life. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Advent, for this season where we are weekly, daily reminding ourselves of the beauty and the richness and the joy of Christ, our King, who came, that we might know you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.